impossible. In fact, it would be irrational to stand and gawk at it. That's irrational, and in fact, that's panic. That's an example of panic. It's called behavioural inaction or negative panic. And you see this happening often, very often, in a lot of the aircraft disasters we've examined. Uh, you'll see, often see people frozen in their seats through panic. Right? They didn't know what to do. The situation was overwhelming and they didn't respond, whereas somebody sitting next to them did get out. Now, that's an example of panic, but not the, not the other thing. So please, whenever you see these situations, if you're ever involved, and I hope you never are involved, don't tell the media that you saw people panicking because they ran away. That's not what people are doing. When we talk about evacuation behaviours, there's actually a set of things we need to consider. We need to consider the configuration of the structure. How many exits are there? How wide are the exits? What's the travel distances and so on? These are important, um, but they're not the only thing that's important. And in fact, in the, if you look at the old building codes, the old building codes, the weakness of the old building codes, in my opinion, was that they mainly focused on configuration when they were talking about evacuation. And that doesn't tell you the whole story. You need to consider the procedures that are in place. Are people trained? Are there staff to direct people? How well are those people trained? What's the environment like? Will there be debris in the way? Will it be dark? Will there be smoke? And then you need to consider the behaviour of the people. And all of these things will interact and influence the behaviour of the people that are responding. And if you're going to try and understand beha evacuation behaviour, you need to understand this complex mixture of behaviours. And if you're going to try and develop computer models for evacuation, those computer models must try and represent these types of interacting behaviours. Now here's another example. This is a real security video um, of a fire in a, um, a little, little store. This is in the UK. Um, this kid's going to come in. Or one of these kids is going to come in here. Not this chap. He's trying to um, divert attention. His mate's going to come in and he's going to set fire to the display here. And the game plan of these kids is, we'll set fire to this. Adults are really intelligent, so they'll run out of there as quickly as possible and then they can steal all the sweeties. That was the game plan. But they, were, they came a cropper because adults aren't as intelligent as uh, the kids thought. This thing's now on fire. Okay, there's a fire going here. And there's only one way in and out of this shop, through here. This gentleman has come in. <laughs> he sees the fire and he joins the queue to buy his packet of fags. <laughs> and he's waiting. He can see the fire. The fire is now growing. It's getting bigger and bigger. The lady here can also see the fire, and she's getting a bit agitated, but she also wants to buy whatever she's trying to buy. And in the meantime, the fire is growing. The guy's getting a little bit agitated. He's getting a bit worried. This is the only way in and out of this shop. There's no other way in and out. The fire is now about two metres high. Another kid comes in. Nothing to do with the uh, original culprits. They, they walk by. You can see the flames licking up here. It's getting really big. And they're just standing around watching this. This is what I call the friendly fire syndrome. People do not understand fire. And a lot of you here don't understand fire. And that's evident from the answers you gave to the questions. We'll come to that later on. Fire is developing. The young lady gets a fire extinguisher. It went off in her face at first. Then she's fanning the fire with the extinguisher, making it spread even further. And then this chap decides to take the fire extinguisher away from her and has a go himself. Um, but he doesn't do any good either. Place is filling with smoke. There's still people in the shop. Uh, the guy with the extinguisher, he's given up now. He goes behind the counter and picks up a couple of bottles of whiskey. <laughs> and now the kids run out and the chap with a bottle of whiskey, he's about to come out here and he leaves the shop. The shop. Now this goes on for a little while longer. And um, it's five minutes. That's five minutes it took for those people to get out. And at that point, when that last person left, the shop flashed over. Okay? It took five minutes and everyone, anyone in that shop would have been killed. 
that la- the chap that got out was the last guy to get out. That's what I call the friendly fire syndrome. People don't understand fire, and so they don't react the correct way to fire. We have to understand that sort of behaviour if we're going to be good fire engineers and if we're going to develop good computer models. We need to be able to represent that behaviour. Now, one of the things we do at Greenwich, we don't only develop computer models, we do a lot of experiments with people to try and understand how they react and behave. Here are a couple of examples. This is some work we did following Labroke Grove. We had a train carriage, we filled it with people, tipped it over, and we measured how people evacuated from the overturned rail carriage. We've done experiments in hospitals. How long does it take to evacuate someone in a bed in a hospital? Hospitals are the last place I want to be, full stop. But if there's a fire, hospitals are not the place to be. It takes a long time to evacuate these people. Looking at large crowd events, this is Royal Ascot, this is before the renovations. We did quite a lot of work with Bureau Happold studying how people behaved at Royal Ascot uh, in order to help us improve the designs for the new, new structure. This is some evacuation work we were doing here at Greenwich. And this is some work we were doing again here in Greenwich, but here in a, um, a similar type of building in Brazil because we were hoping to try and understand does culture have an impact on how people behave? And so to do that, you have to make measurements of how people behave in different cultures. And here we're comparing the behaviour in Brazil and the United Kingdom. A couple more examples. This is some aircraft work we're doing with Airbus. We're measuring how people jump out of aircrafts onto evacuation slides. Here again, another aircraft example. But this time we fill the aircraft with smoke and we're using a thermal imaging camera to see how people behave in smoke. And down here we've got this horrific device. It's uh, belonged to the Royal Navy. It's called a Drew. And it's several decks high. It's on hydraulics. And you can put sailors in there and you rock it and roll it like a ship at sea. And we can make measurements of how people perform climbing ladders like this rope ladder here, climbing stairs and so on. Uh, We need to understand this because when you're doing a a ship evacuation, uh, it's likely that it's going to be in rough seas or some other type of uh, uh, rough condition. So we need to understand how these people, sailors, perform under these conditions if we're going to model this correctly. And finally, here's another example. This is some work we're doing in the United States looking at uh, train evacuations. So we do, we do lots of experiments and we make measurements to try and understand how people behave, but more importantly to try and quantify uh, performance of people under these conditions so we can put that into our models. Okay, now, um, organised research into um, quantifying uh, and modelling human movement and behaviour has been underway for about 40 years. Um, Evacuation modelling research is somewhat more recent. The very first building evacuation model occurred about 1982. So it's a relatively recent discipline. And it's one of the things I keep on telling the consulting engineers who design the shard of glass and all these other wonderful structures. You need to be very careful with fire engineering. It hasn't been around for a long time. We're still learning. So treat the subject with a bit of respect. When we look at the models, there are basically two types of models, two basic types of models. There's a so-called movement-only model, which I call ball-bearing models. And I want to give you an example of what a ball-bearing model is. Uh, And these models are used today in building design. Alarm goes off. The assumption is people react almost immediately, and miraculously they know which exits to go to. These guys are so organised they've got the US flag as well. (laughs) Very calm evacuation, and they miraculously know which exits to go to, just like ball bearings or billiard balls, and they all go where they're supposed to go. There are lots of models that do this, and these models are used today in designing structures, and in my opinion, they're hopeless. People are not ball bearings. The more sophisticated type of model is the movement plus behaviour model. So you incorporate human behaviour in the computer models as well. And the most sophisticated of these are what I call adaptive behaviour models. Now, why is this important? Well, because people are not ball bearings. Here is another example from a security.